One of the greatest parts of the World Cup is seeing underdog teams go far, or as they are known in the world of football, dark horses. Some of the greatest dark horses in modern World Cup history include the 2018 Croatia side, which defeated Argentina and England on its way to the final, and the Ghana side of 2010, who were inches away from becoming the first African team to qualify for the semi-final of the World Cup. But there's one World Cup team that beat all the expectations, but doesn't quite get the same amount of credit. That was the 2014 Costa Rica team, which made the quarterfinals of the World Cup. And while that's impressive on its own, what the Los Ticos team had to overcome on the way to the quarterfinals makes their achievement incredible. This is the story of how Costa Rica shocked the world at the 2014 World Cup. Costa Rica started their journey in the CONCACAF qualifiers. The CONCACAF qualifiers have four rounds, but being one of the top six CONCACAF teams in FIFA's rankings got Los Ticos automatic qualification to the third round. The third round qualification has three groups of four teams, one from the top three CONCACAF FIFA rankings, one from teams in four to six, and two from the teams qualifying from the second round, with the best three teams from each group advancing to the final round. Being ranked 53rd worldwide, Costa Rica were the fifth best team in CONCACAF, and were drawn to Mexico, who were 27th in the world, along with El Salvador and Guyana. Costa Rica's first opponent in their qualifiers was El Salvador at home. They had their dream start with Alvaro Saborio scoring in the 10th minute and Joel Campbell scoring 5 minutes later. But despite going down 2-0, El Salvador would recover and score 2 of their own. The final score was 2 all and the home fans had to watch their team throw away a 2-0 lead. 4 days later, Saborio would score a hat-trick in a 4-0 win against Guyana, but Costa Rica were yet to play the strongest team in their group in Mexico. In the September international window, the fixturing had scheduled Costa Rica's two matches against Mexico in the space of four days. In the first of the two games, Costa Rica hosted the Mexicans in front of 32,500 Ticos fans. Unfortunately, the home fans once again went home disappointed, as Mexico scored twice past Kaylor Navas in a 2-0 win. Both teams travelled to Mexico City for their second match in four days, and Mexico once again found a win, with Javier Hernandez scoring the lone goal in a 1-0 win. The only positive for Costa Rica was that El Salvador had dropped two important points to Guyana, ending the international break with El Salvador one point ahead of Costa Rica with the two teams set to meet each other in a month's time. El Salvador had the home ground advantage and could book qualification to the final round with a win. Costa Rica weren't going to officially book qualifying, but could put it in their hands if they were to get a win. It was a tense game that was controlled by the defenders, but a Jose Cabrera strike gave Costa Rica a 1-0 win. El Salvador still had a chance to qualify, but had to defeat Mexico away from home, while also relying on Guyana to defeat Los Ticos. Guyana not only couldn't defeat Los Ticos, they were battered. Randall Venez and Alvaro Saborio both scored twice as Costa Rica battered a hapless Guyana side 7-0. The win officially put Costa Rica in second place of Group B and placed them in the Hex. The Hex is the final round of CONCACAF qualifying. There are six teams and every team plays each other twice, home and away. The top three teams will automatically qualify for the World Cup, while the fourth place team will go to the Inter-Confederation playoffs. The other five teams along with Costa Rica in the Hex included USA and Mexico, who had both qualified for the past five World Cups and were favoured to go back for a sixth. There was Honduras, who had broken their 28-year World Cup drought in 2010 and were still continuing their golden era, led by Carlos Costa and managed by Luis Suarez. Nope, not that one, the Colombian one. Panama were also in the Hex, who were entering their own golden era but weren't quite at the same spot Honduras were, though so still a threat. And Jamaica were the sixth team, but they weren't that good. Costa Rica had their first match against Panama away. It didn't start well. Luis Henriquez got things underway for Panama with a strike in the 15th minute. 12 minutes later, Roman Torres put the ball in the top court from close range and made it 2 0 Panama. But Costa Rica weren't giving up just yet. Alvaro Saborio nailed a header six minutes before half time, and a Brian Ruiz bicycle kick in the 84th minute would end the match 2 all. A good result for Costa Rica, with all things considered. In the March window, Costa Rica had one of their hardest challenges, having to travel to Colorado to play the US. And you know what happens in Colorado during March? Yeah. It snows. In fact, the weather got so bad that the game has its own Wikipedia page, titled Snow Classico. Costa Rica is a country that has an average temperature 72 to 82 Fahrenheit, or 22 to 28 Celsius, so they were always going to be up against it. Clint Dempsey scored early, and the US never looked back. Costa Rica lost 1-0 and filed a complaint about how the pitch was, submitting a four-dot point letter about how the physical integrity of the players was neglected, the stadium personnel invaded the pitch during the course of the match, the snow covered and concealed the pitch demarcations, and the ball could not roll properly because of the thick layer of snow. Things can happen. Remember, we mustn't forget that it's been snowing. The pitch is quite it's been snowing. Yeah. Are you being serious? It's snowing. for both teams. Yeah, I know, but Come on, Ty. Four days later, back in San Jose for their third match against Jamaica, the sold out crowd turned their backs on the FIFA anthem and were chanting son of a bitch while the anthem played. But the players seem to have moved on and beat Jamaica 2-0 to take four points off their first three games. The June international break had three games for Costa Rica, hosting Honduras and Panama while having to travel to Mexico in between. 
A scrappy goal from Roy Miller Hernandez confirmed a 1 0 win against Honduras. But the big task ahead was the away match against Mexico at the Estadio Azteca. The Azteca can seat 65,000 fans and is a tough away trip for any opponent. A 0 0 draw was the result that played out between the two teams, and leaving the Azteca with a point was certainly a great result for Los Ticos, putting them equal on points with Mexico with a game in hand. That game in hand was then turned to 3 points, as Ron Ruiz and Salso Borgo scored within 3 minutes of each other against Panama, as Costa Rica won 2 0 and entered the dream window in second place. The September window had two games, including Costa Rica's chance of revenge against the USA. USMNT manager Jurgen Klinsmann decided to add fuel to the fire by saying before the match, they thought the snow game shouldn't have been played, but we feel that we would have won by an even wider margin if there wasn't snow. The Costa Rican fans took to that by throwing eggs at the US team bus. The TCOS fans wanted this win badly, and guess what? They got their wish. Johnny Acosta started the scoring in the third minute with a header, before Salso Borges scored with a header of his own seven minutes later. 2-0 after 10 minutes. Clint Dempsey scored a penalty to put some pressure on, but Joel Campbell finished off in the 76th minute to make it Costa Rica 3, USA 1. Not only did Costa Rica get their revenge, but they had a chance to qualify for the World Cup in the next match. All they had to do was beat a Jamaican team who was yet to win a game. Surprisingly, they failed to do that, as Jermaine Anderson scored a 90 second minute equaliser for Jamaica to tie the match 1-1. With Mexico losing and Honduras drawing meant the recent result didn't even matter. Costa Rica were headed to the World Cup. The final two games had no significance to Costa Rica anymore, and they ended their qualifying campaign with a 1-0 loss to Honduras and a 2-1 win against Mexico, finishing the Hex in second place. None of that mattered anymore, what was important was preparing for the World Cup. In the lead up to the World Cup, Costa Rica played six friendlies. It would certainly be fair to say they didn't go well. But like the other 31 coaches, Costa Rica's manager Jorge Luis Pinto had bigger things to worry about than meaningless friendlies. He had to work out what players would be a part of his 23-man squad for the World Cup. Some players wrote themselves into the team, one of them being Kaylor Navas. In the year 2022, Navas has three Champions Leagues and has played for both Real Madrid and PSG. He hadn't done any of that in 2014, but was still a starting goalkeeper for La Liga club Levante, who had finished in a respectable 10th the season prior. Levante only conceded 43 goals in the 13-14 season, the least out of any team not in the top four. There were also two Premier League forwards playing for Costa Rica. Joel Campbell was on the books of Arsenal, while Los Ticos captain Rowan Ruiz played for Fulham. Campbell and Ruiz had both scored goals during the qualifiers, and Pinto's plan was to both of them to contribute some goal scoring set in the World Cup. Another key player who was called up was Junior Diaz, who was playing weekly in the Bundesliga and was one of the fastest players in the world. Diaz ran a top speed 33.8km per hour in the World Cup. It was fair to say he was crucial to what was about to happen. The squad was rounded out with players who were key in the qualifiers, including Johnny Acosta, Celso Borges and Oscar Duarte. While they weren't on many people's radar, Costa Rica had a good team. Maybe they could make the quarterfinals if they got an easy group? Ah, uh, probably not exactly what they were after. According to the FIFA rankings, Group C had the 6th, 9th and 11th best teams all in the same group. Costa Rica were in 28th and were being doubted by every person making their predictions. But let's have a closer look at their opponents. For starters, there was England. The England side was in a bit of an awkward period, with most players either being past their prime or yet to enter it. But still, despite being veterans, Wayne Rooney and Frank Lampard had both played 40 times that season, while captain Steven Gerrard fell one short of the 40 game mark. Goalkeeper Joe Hart had just won the league with Man City, and Liverpool duo Raheem Sterling and Daniel Sturridge looked great together during the prior season, and were now hoping to keep it up playing together in Brazil. There was also Italy, who like England, had a squad filled with veterans, but veterans who knew how to win, as Gianluigi Buffon, Andre Pirlo, Leonardo Bonucci and Giorgio Chiellini had all won the Serie A with the Juventus the past season, despite having a combined age of 127. And finally there was the team who Costa Rica would play first, Uruguay. Uruguay probably had the weakest team out of Costa Rica's three opponents, but they had Luis Suarez, who had just scored 31 goals in 33 games in the EPL, which at the time was a joint record for most goals in a Premier League season. Along with Suarez, Uruguay rounded out the team with Edison Cavani, Diego Gurdin, Diego Forlan and Christian Rodriguez. It was certainly not going to be easy, but Costa Rica stayed positive, and Ryan Ruiz came out and said he was confident Costa Rica could hold their own in the World Cup. Hands up, how many of you believed him? Costa Rica started their World Cup on the 15th of June with a match in Fortaleza against Uruguay. Pinto had chosen to run a 5-4-1 formation. This gave Junior Diaz and Christian Gamboa the freedom to use their speed and join the attack without having to focus on defending as hard as they would in a back four. Joel Campbell was the lone striker for the team, while Brown Ruiz played behind him as a centre midfielder, next to Yeltsin Tejeda. In the 24th minute, Diego Forlan put a free kick into the box and Junior Diaz rugby tackled Diego Lugano. Edson Cavani converted the penalty and everything was going as expected. No goals were scored to the remaining first half, but Kaylor Navas made a great save to get some momentum for the Ticos. It wasn't until the 54th minute, when Joel Campbell took the ball off his chest and slammed it in off his left foot. 1-1, the latest for Costa Rica. Three minutes later, Costa Rica won a free kick, and Christian Bolanas put the ball in the penalty area. 
Oscar Juarez was there to head the ball home, and Costa Rica had flipped the game on its head in under 200 seconds. To cap it all off, in the 84th minute, Marco Avena slid home the ball past Uruguay's goalkeeper, Fernando Mazlera. Costa Rica ended the game 3-1, and incredibly, ended match day one on top of the table. Now while this was a good win, people still had their doubts. Considering Luis Suarez was nursing an injury and didn't play, many assumed this was just a lucky result and Costa Rica would still be put away against Italy and England. The next match was against Italy, who had just been in England 2-1. The winner of the match would book their qualification for the round of 16. But it was in the 44th minute when Brian Ruiz would jump up, head off the crossbar and score the only goal of the match to get Costa Rica a 1-0 win. And when the full-time whistle went, the TCOS players were ecstatic. Not only on the pitch, but also back home in Costa Rica where the fans were celebrating their qualification for the knockouts. It really is just one of the reasons why people love the World Cup. There was one more match in the knockouts, a dead rubber match against England. England weren't as bad as some people remember in this World Cup, but they were yet to pick up a point after 2-1 losses to both Italy and Uruguay. But even though England couldn't make it out of the group, they still had their pride to play for. To show the fans they were proud to wear the shirt, to show some fight and provide some passion for the proud country of England. So the England team went out there and got a nil-nil draw. While there was slight disappointment they couldn't go 3 for 3, the point was more than enough for Costa Rica, as it meant they could avoid Group C's winner Colombia, who while being a dark horse themselves, were a team no one wanted to face, led by promising youngster James Rodriguez. Costa Rica would instead face Greece, still a good side, but an easier opponent than Colombia. Greece were led by their strong defence that consisted of Socrates Papadopoulos, Costas Manolas and Jose Holobas. While Orestes Cornelius wore the gloves, and Brian Ruiz's Fulham teammate Costas Madroglu wore the number 9 for the Greek. The first half was boring, there's no need to talk about it. But a quick shout out to Kaylor Navas. I've mainly focused on the attack in this video, but Navas was brilliant the entire World Cup and was Costa Rica's player of the match against Greece. In the 52nd minute, Brown always took Costa Rica's only shot on target in the entire match and found the net. Three minutes later, this happened. No penalty. In the 66th minute, Oscar Duarte, who was already on a yellow card, took out Jose Holobas' Alice Tree part of two. He was sent off, and Costa Rica had to play the last 25 minutes with 10 men. But despite being down a man, Kaylor Navas was not going home, and pulled out one last save to win the match. Great save! There's the equaliser! There is the equaliser! Oh. Greece's equaliser in the 91st minute assured that another half now would be played. Both key chances belonged to Greece, but Kaylor Navas was just incredible. Nine the Greeks twice and sending the match to penalties. The first seven penalties all found the back of the net, giving Los Ticos a 4 3 lead. Veteran Theophanus Gekas was up for penalty number 8, and Kaylor Navas decided to move into prime left Yashin. Defender Michael Lamana was up for Costa Rica, and now into the top left corner. Costa Rica 5, Grace 3. Costa Rica were into the final 8. The quarter final match was against the Netherlands, who were a team no one wanted to face. They had started off their World Cup by scoring 5 goals past reigning champion Spain, and then beat Australia and Chile to finish top of Group B before narrowly beating Mexico in the round of 16, courtesy of a glass yarn Hontelef penalty which DEFINITELY DID NOT COME FROM AN IRON ROBIN DIVE. Due to a Nigel de Jong injury, Lewis van Hull had to make some adjustments to his team, playing a winger and a defensive midfielder as wingbacks while starting a frightening front three of Memphis Depay, Iron Robin and Robin van Persie. Costa Rica looked at that front three and adopted their inner Jose Mourinho, parking the bus. I am Jose Mourinho. But once again, Kaylon Navas was elite, making four first half saves and denying the man in orange at every chance he got, keeping a clean sheet over two hours of football. Unfortunately for him, his teammates couldn't find the net, and we went to penalties. With barely any time remaining in the match, Lewis Van Hal took a gamble and substituted his starting goalkeeper Husper Sillison for Tim Krull, who he preferred for pens. Substituting goalkeepers for shootouts doesn't always work, just ask Thomas Stuckel, but Van Hal's gamble would indeed pay off for the Dutch. 2-1 down, Captain Brown Ruiz stepped up and was denied by a brilliant Tim Krul save. The next four penalties were scored before the hero against Greece, Michael Amano, stepped up for Costa Rica and was denied. The Dutch moved on to the semi-finals and Costa Rica's incredible World Cup run was over. Despite the heartbreaking loss, Costa Rican fans could take pride in knowing what their team had done. 
The team was treated like heroes after returning to their homeland, and it meant more than anything to all the football fans living in Costa Rica. Individually, the biggest winner out of this was Keylor Navas, whose incredible keeping in Brazil earned him a transfer to Real Madrid, where he would win three Champions League titles before moving to PSG. But the 2014 World Cup also led to a great aftermath for Costa Rica themselves. Manager Jorge Luis Pinto left the team after the Netherlands loss, but former Ticos defender Paolo Wanchope replaced him, and Costa Rica got on with it. In the 2014 Central America, Costa Rica made the final after getting out of a three-team group with Panama and Nicaragua. And only 70 days after the devastating Netherlands loss, Costa Rica beat Guatemala 2-1 to win their 8th Central America. The 2015 Gold Cup and 2016 Cup of America were tournaments to forget for Costa Rica, but the important thing was qualifying for the 2018 World Cup, which they did. Unfortunately, Costa Rica were grouped in Russia, but going to another World Cup was huge for the team's growth. And after defeating New Zealand in the Inter-Confederation playoffs, we're now going to see Costa Rica in their third consecutive World Cup this November. But that is going to wrap up today's video guys, and yes, the video essays are back and they are here to stay. I've got more coming, so subscribe to this channel, and be sure to check out my second channel, as well as my website, where you can read this story and many others all for free. Thanks for watching, like, comment and sub, and I'll see you next time.